one to you now. <laughs> well, we're going to learn this lesson together because I finished this just five minutes before the service started. It's, it's been a busy day, a lot of opportunity, uh, both in, the, in, my, in my job job. And then I got here today, uh, we had some meetings with the air conditioning people for the building, which is blessed, and, um, and then some other meetings. So good things are good. The building's going to be good. Just be patient. Uh, it's all going to come together at some point. It's going to collide at some point. And uh, Joe didn't kill anybody on the bus drive through Pine Harbor today, so... He didn't go to Pine Harbor. Oh, he didn't go to Pine Harbor. They won't let, me they won't let you go back. He's been boarded out of, out of Pine Harbor, so... They won't let anybody back. That was Joe and... I mean, that was Guy Sherry. We went Sunday morning, though. It was... Me and me and Tony. It's one of those uh, testing of the patience. <laughs> and the willingness. Had it now. So... If you would tonight, turn to Nehemiah, where we were Sunday. Chat, uh, Nehemiah, uh, like I said, find Psalms and then turn back just a, a few pages to the book of Job. and uh, You'll find Nehemiah, a very tiny little book in there, just a few chapters, but a very powerful little book. Tonight I want to talk to you about identifying purpose, and that was a big part of Sunday service. Uh, asking for God's help. And sometimes I think we do, but maybe not enough. And the last thing we might touch on tonight is waiting on God's timing. And I know that one is probably one that we absolutely struggle with. But uh, as we look back on the story of Nehemiah from, from a teaching perspective, I noted two things or three things of interest. Uh, Nehemiah's prayer relationship with God, the timing of his patience to wait upon the Lord, and the time it actually took. And those are the three things I just kind of mentioned to you. And if we consider the first, looking at the history of, of, of Ezra and Nehemiah, uh, those, those books are actually in the Hebrew, are one book themselves. But uh, and, and looking at the history of that and considering how Israel got into this mess in the first place, we have to go back uh, a, a couple other books and look at kings and so forth. But how they got there, was anybody know? Well, that definitely would get them there, but they were poked by an army at that point. But good answer. But actually they were there because of idolatry, right? Well, yeah, they were taken into captivity for 70 years. There you go. So that first wave of attacks, and, and when we talk about that, this is also, uh, I mentioned this Sunday, I think, or maybe last Wednesday, y'all know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and how they refused to, to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar and his 90-foot-built statue, because what he was trying to do was, the first wave of raids, he had taken some of the, the more affluent uh, family, young family men to, to, uh, to Babylon, because he had pre pre preparing them to be, if you will, the administrators as he brought more of Israel in. See, this was all of a plan of his, to conquer Israel, and then to Basically, if I could use the words, brainwash them into uh, a, a non, if I could say, non-Christian religion or a, a lack of faith in God, basically. So there, there's so much going on in Nehemiah that you have to really go back and read through to get there. But if we consider the first wave of attacks, the ultimate destroy and the ultimately destroying of Judah, Judea, the city of Jerusalem, the, the, and the Temple of Solomon, it started in 605 B.C. Now, remember, in, before Christ, we're counting down to go up. Does that make sense? <laughs> Never made sense to me. I never got this in school either. But kind of like below zero. Huh? Kind of like below zero. Yeah, we're, we're starting high and we're going to zero. When we get to zero, now we talk, you know, 21st century. So if you remember, so when I give you these dates, don't get confused because in 605 B.C. is when this started. Uh, and, and, and again, I, I mentioned this, Sonny. This whole process, and, and this is kind of, to me, was a lesson. Like when sin gets in our life sometimes, it, it kind of flips us around. And sometimes it takes a long time to do to recover, right? Amen. Because this whole passage, if you look from the time that God, well, actually, God warning Israel goes back forever, but when he finally allowed King Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon, or, or Judea, Jerusalem to be conquered, from that point to the rebuilding of the final walls was 160 years. 70 years in exile, and then another, what's the difference in that? Uh, 90, years 90 years just roaming around trying to rebuild, and there's a whole beautiful story in that because when they did come back to Israel, uh, to, to Jerusalem the first time, uh, there, there's some really good uh, uh, information in Ezra and Ezra about that because the people first began to wander around and thought we should build our own homes first, we should take care of ourselves. That delayed the, the, the restoration. Uh, and then the, uh, the other part was uh, they began to marry in and out of the relationships. And then the third part was they had some help from the Amorites and some of the Mitites and others, all those uh, termites and all those folks, they kind of moved in and, and just said, you know, I don't think we ought to do this. And again, Israel kind of went into the ways of the world again. They just kind of, they kind of faded there. So in 605 B.C., the first raid started with King Nebuchadnezzar, and it repeated themselves in 597 B.C. and concluded with the destruction of the temple the first time in 586 B.C. So again, remember, we're counting, we're counting down to go up. Uh, 
And then King Cyrus, uh, which was of the Persian army, came on, on the scene, conquering Babylon. I mean, there's going to get history, and that's exciting, isn't it? In, in, in 539. So again, and the, and the importance of that is that uh, the Persian uh, conquered the Neo-Babylon uh, uh, regime, and that was when they released the first stage of the Israelites. King Cyrus said, you can go home, kind of a phase one. The sad part of it is, as we talked about Sunday, only about 50,000 decided to go home. Why? Yeah, even though the exile was hard, they still found it more comfortable to stay in Babylon. It already is like, related to the Greek life. You know, and of course, I'm, as your pastor, I'm always looking for those court, those analogies and, and, and likenesses of how is that applicable to America today. Well, we get as Christians, we get kind of comfortable living, you know, Living on the edge a little bit, right? Living in the world, not in the world. We're Christians, but, eh, you know, Blue Bell ice cream is good too, right? So just saying. Anyway, a little bit more to get you there. They allowed the, This allowed the Jews to start moving home in 538 B.C. And, and the final wave, where we're at tonight, returned with Nehemiah in 445 B.C. So that's your 160 years of, of progression back, backwards to go forwards, right, Jenny? So the actual temple was built, rebuilt, again, Ezra, and there's a whole, you had Haggai and Zechariah that was involved in that, if you know, if you just in the names. Uh, and then you had Sheshbazar, Shesh I think is how you pronounce that name, and Zeberul, Zeberubul, Bull, Zerubbabul. Not good Texas boys, I'm just saying. Could have, been, could have simplified this by saying Tim and John went down to build the temple. What? Uh, Sam and Paul went to build the temple, and uh, Tim and John came along with them. But in this case, we had Haggai and Zechariah and Sheshbazar, Zar, I'm sorry, and, and Zerubbabel. Uh, and this, they, they, they were all part of the first stage that went, or excuse me, the, the first, first stage that went back. And then just, just, I hope I'm not confusing you, but just to pull it all together, then Ezra went, and that was the second wave that went back. And he went back to, he was an encourager, basically, but he was also a, 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 a prophet. But he went back to encourage, and then finally, like I said, we get to Nehemiah, which Nehemiah was just, not just, but he was a he cup was he, he was a cupbearer, right? And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. So if you look at all of this, from the point of Israel's uh, repercussion of their choice, and that's always the good part to remember. God said, here's my life, here's the way you should live your life, and then it becomes... Our choice. And that's the sweet part, right? Our choice to how we want to live. But God says when you live outside of what I instruct you to do, guess what? Consequences. There's complications and consequences to our decisions. So it's it's really kind of simple when you think about it and look at the history of the Bible and the stories. Now, an, uh, an additional interesting part of the story, and I'm just reading this for the first time too, so let me see what I wrote. Um, the, the interesting part of the story is that part of the reason it took so long to restore it, and this is what I mentioned earlier, to restore the kingdom of Judah, and, and, and after even after the uh, Israels were freed, the, again, they got sidetracked in building their own houses, marrying into other cultures, and, and again, this is why Ezra was kind of sent down to encourage uh, 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 Shezbar and Zebarold and those guys to kind of move along with this thing, right? Uh, kind of a reinstruction. And that's, you know, that's a whole lot of history in 2.7 seconds, right? So to the point, sin can take a while to overcome and nothing happens immediately sometimes in exchange of that. But on a per more personal level than that, I would like you to consider Nehemiah's position in this. Uh, and, and the way that he, he, looked at, uh, he, he looked at identifying the burden, and we talked heavily about this Sunday about, he, he, you know, and we're going to touch again in, in, in Nehemiah 1, verse 1, but he identified the burden, and the burden is, the beautiful part of this, this is what God laid on his heart, Right? Yeah, he had nothing. He, he, he had, this happened years and years before his time, basically, mm -hmm. didn't it? Yeah. yeah. That's why I see he's coming in on the very, right. and part of that, why did I give, I'm sorry, why did I give you the 160 years? Because all this, when we sometimes read the Bible, we go, okay, page two, <laughs> page three, page four, page five. Okay, this all took place in three days, right? No, this was 160 years. That's just 160 years worth of history if you don't go back and just look at everything else with Israel. And, and I'm leaving out a ton of data. There's a lot to work with. But the point is, from the, the beginning of God saying you can go home or being actually being captured, the 70 years of exile, and then 90 more years for actually the temple to be restored and the actual walls to go back up, right? Uh, and there's some beautiful analogies in that. We, we, you know, I, I don't have them here. They may come out Sunday sermon, but so many, I mean, like we talked about, if you have no walls around your home, 
if you have no walls around your person. We say, well, Tim, walls, walls are so defining. Now, most people don't want to hear the word walls, right? That's, that's separation and segregation. And I, No, actually, see, it, walls really represent the fact of what do you believe in? Your boundaries. Right. They're your boundaries, right? You know, it's like when we say people, well, I, don't, I don't tell my children no. Well, what do you do when the ball bounces into the street? And the little child is running towards the street, and they don't know the word no. Yeah. Stop. And that's, I mean, there's a lot of symbolism, obviously, in the Bible, but, you know, that's really part of what that is, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's protection from the outside, but it's also protection from the inside because it says, this is how I'm going to live my life. I've established these walls around me, and it's not that I don't want to be sociable. They have gates in the wall. You can come in and out, but this is my boundaries around my home, around my life. Separate, right? Separate yourself. Yes. Separate, and that's what, that's really, again, the, the concept of what God said. And if you go into this, there's, like I said, when I talk about they married into different cultures, and God came in and said, well, what are we doing here? Right? He said, see, that, when we talked about this the other day, and it wasn't so much about race as it was about spiritual relationship, right? And we talk about this in the New Testament, that if you marry outside, you marry an unsaved and an unsaved together. Guess what? There's going to be conflict from day one, right? Unequally yoked. Yeah, unequally yoked, right? I mean, you've got a person that's raised in the church, believes in God, loves God, wants to be with God, and you have somebody raised outside the world. We say, well, we'll get together. You got a, you've already got a conflict of, of what? Not the person, but the belief, right? Yeah. So it, it's those types. It's like being like a guy. I mean, we say opposites attract. Not always well. Crazy attracts, too. Yeah, Not always well. <laughs> Right? I'm just saying. Just wait. Don't be looking at me. Don't even look at me. But so, you know, so there, there, there's so much more going on when you open your eyes and read. But tonight, and, uh, identifying the burden, asking for God's help, and waiting in God's patience. So, first of all, let's consider how Nehemiah identified the burden. More importantly, how Nehemiah responded to what God laid on his heart, which was to serve the people of Israel. That's what he laid on his heart. So, uh, and this was the core of Sunday's message, which I asked, what breaks your heart? Because this is part of how you begin to answer, what, what, is, what is it I really feel called to do for God, right? And that, I mean, and, and I was thinking about that, they, sometimes we just isolate that so much, but what can I do at church for God, when in fact is, it could be in your own home. You may need to put up some new walls. The good part, the good part about this it's just like in this story, and this may come out, this is where I've been all week thinking about the concept. Think about the walls laid down. They're completely laid down. They're burned. The gates are burned. And if you think about the old time cities, the big thick concrete or, or stone walls, and they had the, the big heavy doors. You've seen them on all the old movies, right? But think about it. With those walls down, you're totally vulnerable to everything that comes in and out, right? You're, you're totally vulnerable to what comes to your mind, what you allow in, what you allow out. And so when you ask... Uh, from that, what breaks your heart? It begins to ask, you have to begin to ask yourself what what is that real key element? And like I said, it's not always just the church, but it could be that you need to reestablish some walls in your home, right, or in your personal life. Because the beautiful part is, you see, in this lesson, even though it took 160 years, walls are always restorable, huh? See the beauty in that? See, we think, man, I really messed up. We hear this all the time, man. I really. Man, I said this to this person, and man, now I got to thinking about it. And, and you know, most of the time when I found out, most people already forgot what I said about two minutes after I said it. I carried around for about a week thinking, boy, I really said the wrong thing there. And then I found out they wouldn't even listen in the first place. Why? I don't know if disrespect, but most of us are self-absorbed in ourselves. It's like, oh, I was going to be mad about that, but I ain't got time for that. I got to move on, right? I got to get some ice cream. I'm just saying. So sometimes in that... It's always a beautiful analogy, I think, of that to say, look, anytime. I mean, here's Israel, God's people, totally uh, uh, isolated, exiled for 70 years, completely out of God. And then God says, here, I'm going to put the walls back up and restore life to your, to your belief, right? See, it's never too late. Like Butch the witness, it's never late too late, is it? Never too late with a child. Never too late with a friend. Never too late to say, hey, I was wrong. I mean, we're going to put the walls back up, right? I mean, that's, the, that's what I see in the passage. But anyway, Nehemiah 1, i got to hurry now. I thought I didn't have a time. Now we're going to not have enough time to get through it. So Nehemiah 1, briefly, uh, the words of Nehemiah, uh, the son of, I'm in Nehemiah 1, verse 1, sorry. The words of Nehemiah and the son of Hakaliah. Now, it happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year as, as I was in uh, Shushan of the citadel. And I, like I said, Sunday, Shushan of the citadel it was the palace in which King uh, uh, 
Cyrus lived, and this is also the comfort that Nebuchadnezzar was living in. Think about it. He's the cupbearer for the, the, the king, right? That's a good life back then, right? Good food. Uh, the only risk he ran was if he got some poison from an enemy and dropped dead. But at that point, he'd be dead, right? So after, you know, a horrible death probably. But anyway. anyway uh, and it says that Hanani, one of my brothers, and we talked about this being a satellite, came from a certain man from Judea, and they asked him concerning the Jews who escaped, who had sur survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And I blew through that too fast. Let me back up. And asked them concerning the <coughs> Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And like I said Sunday, these were the two concerns that he shared for who? Someone else. The Jerusalem people and my homeland. What's going on with my with what's going on with, with, with where I where I came from? And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who have suffered the exile is in great trouble and shame. You may have some different words there. I think this is the ESV version, but the great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Folks, that's living your life wide open right there, right? No limitations to what's coming in. In verse 5, he said, As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying for God in heaven. In, in this brief passage, Nehemiah identified his place, purpose, and plan for his life. Now, I want you to hold on to this for, 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 for the fact of he also, his occupation, though, was what? A servant to the king. I'm a servant to the king. I'm a cup holder. Yeah. So I want you to hang on to that, and I also want you to think about the timing of this. But the very next thing we see, if you look at verse 5, is that Nehemiah did what? Prayed. 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 Nehemiah addressed God in prayer, seeking forgiveness of a nation. And as we talked about Sunday, and I'm sorry to be redundant, but we did. It, he talked about the nation and himself collectively. We have sinned against you, Father God. Why? Because he really has sinned? Could have. I don't know. It doesn't say if he did or not. But what we do know is that he accepted the responsibility for what had happened to Israel. And that should be a burden of ours because, like I said, Sunday, sometimes I think when we get saved, we think we have removed ourselves from the condition of the world. And spiritually we have. But it doesn't remove us from the responsibility that we concluded, we, 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 we shared, right? What I'm, go back into the world. Yeah, what I'm saying is we, we're not clean in the situation, are we? And that's really what Nehemiah was saying. I'm praying not only for myself, but I'm praying for my. I'm praying for, that God, you would forgive it's, uh, the nation of Israel. I'm, I'm accepting full responsibility for that prayer request. It's kind of like Job did in, in Job chapter one. Remember, it said, and he prayed for his children in case they might sin. That's a pretty awesome prayer, right? right. I, I, I know my parents did. They prayed a lot for me. I'm just saying, and I appreciate it that they did, right? But also note in chapter one, verse one, the words that it came to pass in the month of Kislev, the 20th year. Now, Kislev is November, December time frame. This is about 446 B.C., but it's important to just hold on to that because that's really November, December at that time. Hang on to that because if we get there, I want to touch on that in chapter 2. So now I, uh, I, I said I wanted to cover three points tonight. One, identify the burden. We just did that in chapter 1. Nehemiah identified his burden, his purpose, his plan, and his place. And, and, and many of us think about identifying, and, and this is that part I was telling about the other day, what breaks your heart? Because many of us spend years walking around, not that it's not critical, and not, again, not that there's scriptural, not that there's not scriptural verse for it, but we spend a lot of time thinking about what our special talent is. Our special talent uh, for God. And, and, uh, and when, um, as, as we're seeking for, for God to use us in that way, right? We want to know, what is, what's my talent? What's... Uh, when, when the point I want to make to you, God often uses every talent that a person has. Huh? You say, well, what's my talent? What's your skill set? What have you done in your life? Who are you in Christ? What have you done in your occupation? Because we have to remember, God is constantly preparing us for service. Right. You may think, well, like, like Nehemiah, I'm just a cup holder. How could I possibly be prepared for what I was? Well, cup holder was a very, uh, a very uh, high position within that organ, uh, within that time frame and that structure. But what I really want to drive home to you is that the things that you have in your life, the things that you've learned, God plans and prepares you for the things that He's going to use you for in the future. And if we believe that our lives belong to God and we belong to God, then 
He has made things. He has put things in your life so that you can use them. Right. Is that making sense? It's, it's, see, it's, I, I want to stress to you, it's not just <clears throat> one thing. It's all the things you have done in your life as you've been as you prepared for the place, purpose, and plan. I fully believe that about my life. Nehemiah was the cupbearer for the king. That was his occupation. But if you read this story, you'll find out he was a leader. He was an encourager. He was the governor, which means he was a politician as well. Uh, he was an architect, a builder, a peacekeeper, and a negotiator. And by the way, at towards the end of the building, the walls, they got into a battle with the enemies, and they fought. So he was also a, a, a soldier, if you will. See, many times we think, what, what is my talent? When God said, who are you? Huh? See, I've given you whatever talents and skills and life sets that you have. Many times we focus on the one thing, trying to desperately determine the one thing we can contribute to God, when in fact, when we give it all to God, God uses all you'll give him. I promise you. A lot of people think, think you've got to be the absolute best at something before you can give that part. But just willingness, I think, is the, you know, the key. It, it, it's willingness, Joe, and I think the beauty part of it is, and we, when we really do just accept who we are, we finally go, okay, this is it. This is my skill set. This is what I know. This is how I talk. This is my vocabulary. And we think, wow, man, your vocabulary is not very good. You could use a higher education. You need to go to school. You could do that. God said, I just saved you just the way you are because guess what? I created you the way you are. See, we make too much excuses for what we need to do and what we need to change when God said, just come on. Give me what you, that's, I mean, every, the, the five loaves and two fishes. What do you got, little boy? Five loaves and two fishes. Okay, I'll fed 20,000. It goes back to Second Chronicles a few weeks ago when he said, I don't need you to do anything. I just need you to show up. Be willing. Give me what you got. And some people just, man, they just want to grind on that. And the sad part is it takes away, not, it, you know, just, just to harbor things like that is just exhausting. It really is, isn't it? Just to hold on to something that, just give it away. Give it to God. God said, I'll take five loaves, two fishes. I'll make you dinner. See, understand the simplicity. Think, I mean, as me as a, as a pastor of this church, I, I've been in the same job for 43 years. I was like, my business experience is not great, but I've got some. Relationship experience. Now, that's questionable at times. <laughs> I, I thought, boy, when you write that one, there's going to be some people, you know, we see your relational skill sets every now and then. Yeah, I've got, I got an anger management problem to work with. But dealing with customers for 43 years and knowing when to say what, the right time, people's personalities, it, it, it's a blending, right? All of you are different. You have different interests. You have different thoughts. Man, it's, I'm, 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 thank you for the opportunity, but sometimes it's difficult to guess did that upset? Did that make, are they happy? Are they sad? Worries me to death. Right. <laughs> and then there's Joe who's like, Whoa. and some days I'm like, boy, I wish I had more Joe's personality because I don't care. But the sad part is I do care because I want the church to hold together and you want it to be in harmony. And Right? So uh, that computer skills, I use everything I got, Mike. It ain't much, but PowerPoint, right? I mean, I learned that a long time ago. Spreadsheets. Um, building skills, landscaping, study skills, sitting for four or five hours trying to figure out what I'm going to say uh, through God's Word, presentation skills, energy level, you know. I'm, I'm, and I'm not saying, I'm not waving my flag, but what I'm saying is, we all just, way. every one of you have things about you that you're thinking, I'm waiting on my special skill, God, when you are His special skill. I just Amen. use a line of books in the Word. <laughs> and Butch has that level about him, right? If it gets, you know, uh, again, last uh, last Saturday we were we were listening to the lady at the VBS deal, and you know, like she was talking about, she goes to Walmart, and this morning, uh, she, well, let me let me finish that thought. She goes to Walmart and just more or less just offers to help people, right? Because it starts a relationship with them, right? Can I get that off the shelf for you? Can I help you with a car? With things we don't, little things that, and it was a very good point because sometimes. We're trying to think, oh, man, i got to lead somebody to Christ. Mm. No, it starts with relationship first, right? You can't just walk up to somebody and say, hey, you ought to get saved, because they're probably going to go, unless they're, unless the Holy Spirit's right there, right? They're probably going to do what, Butch? Yeah. Oh, thanks so. And there's a Fruit Loop on aisle three in Walmart right now, yeah. right? Uh, th th there's some guy running around the store, uh, wacko, trying to get everybody saved. Well, anyway, you see my point? Like this morning, there was a lady looking for uh, something to wipe the gas off her. And I said, here, i got some tissues in my truck. Here you go. Just have, thank you. Have a blessed day. How about just kindness? Yeah. I mean, we all want it, right? Man, I wish everybody would be kind. Well, if it don't start with us, 
What's it going to happen? Who wants to talk to somebody who's like a fixed to bite your head? Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, to, to the point I was trying to make, and I'm already going to run out of time to ever get the second point. But anyway, you, it never works that way. Man, I was just in there typing away. I'm not going to have enough. I've got 22 pages too much. Anyway, so you can see my occupation as a salesperson all these years has made me, a, I wrote the word successful salesperson. I, that's a bit strong, but I, it, it's kept me employed for 43 years. But, but, but I've been a supervisor, I've been a worker, I've been in the plants, I've been in the job sites, uh, I've, 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 I've built cars, I've, I've, nego I've been a negotiator. Uh, built houses? I built, ha rebuilt, more than I built, but I built, re set up presentations for people. I've got, I've got lunch and learns, that's a, that's a deal where you're going to do product sales, so you got to schedule meetings and, and serve. I had a band, I played the guitar, write music, I've, I've done artwork, and you say, well, that's quite a list. No, but every one of you have a list within you that if you don't let Satan say, man, that's just five loaves and two fishes. No, that's all God asks you to be. When we just say God, but see, here's the deal. You have to be willing to give it to God. See, as far as I know, he gave me whatever skills I have and whatever talents. I'm not in pursuit of one talent, but he's not in pursuit of my one, but he's, he's pursuit of anything that I'll do for him. Any, anything. It's like saying, yes, I have all this, but I will only give you this, God. This is all you can have. And honestly, think about it. Many times, that's really all we want to say because that's all I really want to give to God because if I give him all, he might take all. But then at the same time, we know he won't take any more than he needs. If he wanted it all, it's kind of like going back to tithing. What's he tell us? 10%. Work that in. I'm getting to be a better Baptist preacher, Butch. Work that in. Slid that under the carpet there. But no, honestly, think about it. If he wanted all of it, he could say, I want 100% of it, right? But he never takes but 10%. It was his to begin with. Well, it's the same way when you look at your life. You get six days a week, and he said on the seventh, what? I want that one-tenth. I want that one-seventh of the week. Why? Relax, honor me, and I will honor you, and take a day off and relax. Sorry, I'm not picking on you. It just came up. I knew, I'm always guilty when you're sitting there like, he thinks I'm picking on you. I'm not. But you should. Oh, that's good. Anyway, but you know what I'm saying? It's our day of rest. And he never asked for all. He said, you can have six days a week. How many hours is that, Joe? Add it up real quick. Six twenty-four. Six times twenty-four. Anyway, it's more than one day a week, which is more than twenty-four hours, right? When we go back where we started, these these are the walls that I have around me. The good what? I'm only going to work six days a week, and I'm not going to work on the seventh. Well, I got to work on the seventh. I'm still not picking on you, mom. I got to work on the seventh because I need an income. I understand. But here's the deal. Do you believe your God will take care of your life? Because it always comes back to that question, right? It's the faith that we have to believe that God will take care of my life. That, he, that, that I trust him enough. So in this, when, uh, when I said God will use all of you if you'll give it to him. And I'm not saying, like I said, I'm not saying ignore the passage in the Bible that says find your talent. I got it. It's, it's, it's encourager. It's prayer. It's, 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 I, I got it. But don't get hung up on the fact that he created you. He'll use what he's got of you. Now, tonight, that satisfies point one, purpose, place, and, uh, purpose, place, and plan, and it identified Nehemiah's burden. Therefore, the next step is ask God for help. Unfortunately, it's 730. So you just have to wait in anticipation. <laughs> and if I remember next week to pick up here again. So I'm sorry. But briefly, I'll give you this in case you want to study it. If you look, in, uh, if you look at the first part, he went to God in prayer, right? And then if you look at verse 4 in chapter 2, if you real quickly, I'll just kind of burn through this last part in the last two minutes here. If you look at, uh, let me find it right quick, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 4. Now in chapter 2, what's happened is Nehemiah has been waiting for the time to talk to his boss about relocation plans, right? That's what I'm, so, I'm paraphrasing, but he's asking for a suspension of work so that he can go 700 miles and rebuild the walls. This is, this is that, here, and, and it's not enough time. This is occupation versus reality of my spiritual life to God. Hmm? This is my occupation. I'm a cupbearer for the king. My call to the purpose of my life is to rebuild the walls in Jerusalem. Is that making sense? Now I've got to rectify what? Well, you got to reconcile somehow. I got to reconcile. This is the life I built for myself. And this is the life that God's given me. And anyway, we can spend. See, it's so beautiful. You can spend hours in it. But in verse four, look at verse four. 
he, so he tells the king, uh, first he's all, he says, why are you upset finally? I mean, he's been moping around for, a, I'm going to share that with you just a minute. He's been moping around. You ever had that, had, got that out of your kids? What's wrong with you? So he finally says, okay, what's wrong with you? And he goes on to tell him, this is my burden. Man, I love you. And he actually says, look at this part, may the king live forever. I mean, he already knows this is not going to go well. And I'm sure as the king, he knew it would. Anybody, somebody comes up and says, man, I love you, Joe. Yeah, I'm worth 50 bucks. Anyway, so he says, he says, why, he says, uh, may the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's tomb, lies waste and the gates are burned with fire, with fire, excuse me, with fire. And then in verse 4, he says, then the king said to me, what do you request? What do you want? You see, see, human nature hadn't changed, right? Man, he laid it on thick. I love you, Pearl. Can you bring me some more jelly? I mean, he just, you know what I mean? He <laughs> laid it on thick. And he said, so, I, but here's the part I want to have. Look at that last part. So I prayed to the God in heaven. And my point to this is, how many times do you really, 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 really pray enough before God? I mean, he told us to take all things to him, right? Because a lot of times what we do is we spend a little time up front asking for God's direction. And we spend a lot of time in the reverse doing what? Begging for God's grace that we went down that road, right? right. Whoo! I mean, how much more prayer have we spent on the backside of a decision prior to just going to him and saying, hey, I need your help. Now look at verse, look at chapter 1, verse 1. Excuse me. Go back to chapter 1, verse 11. I, I missed that part. I'm sorry. But it said, oh, Lord, I pray, please let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who desire to fear your name and let your servants prosper this day. I pray, grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So, okay, in, in chapter 1, again, in the month of, 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 of November and December, Nehemiah prays, shows his broken heart, and then in verse 5, he starts a prayer to God, and he closes it with, please, Father God, prosper me. That word prosper, you're thinking money. No, he's saying, God, bless me in my conversation with my boss. I'm going to go before my boss. I live in the palace. Think about this. I eat the best food. I drink the best wine. I have the best clothes. I have my own room. I have my own pool. Probably had his own servants. Probably had, he had what he wanted, right? I mean, that was the king's king palace. And yet he says, who, I go before this guy. is really good to me. He helps me a lot. He's given me all of these things of the world, but I want to leave. Think about this now. I want to leave and go to a barren spot in the desert full of camels, Right? and rebuild the wall and fight off Amorite soldiers. Right. <laughs> See, occupation versus will of God. Huh? That's the beautiful part. i got to wind this down, don't I? But anyway, I want to share that with you. See, he prays here, and then he prays again. Now, if you're going to read the rest of the chapter, he also becomes a negotiator because he begins to ask for lumber and wood. He didn't even get out of it. He was kind of like a child, right? He said, you're asking? Okay, here's what I want. Right? Here's the list. I got a list right here. How are you going to work it out? Are you going to do a city? Because he see, he needed the king's authority to be able to tell the other folks. If you look at that, there's there's keeper of the forest, keeper of, of, of other men in the kingdom that he needed their help. Plus, he needed safe passage from Babylon all the way back to Jerusalem. So he he gives the king this list of requests, talking to the king, king, right? The king that says, "I can kill you dead right now," right? So that he prays. And so the, the second point was, like I said. How many times do we go to God first instead of praying for grace later, right? And then the last thing I'll share with you real quickly uh, is in the very last part of this, I mentioned this. If you go back to the first of chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in the month of Nisan, if I'm saying that right, Nisan. I almost thought that said Nisan, and I thought, look, they have trucks back then. But <laughs> Nisan. And Nisan is March, April. When did this start? November, December, so four months later is when this conversation is going on. See, that's why I want to tell you, sometimes we read the Bible as boom, 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 when the fact of it is, this is a story four months later, and Nehemiah this whole time, he says, way over here, I learned of my purpose, place, and plan. And at the end of that month, he prayed to God, God prosper me, bless me when I go to ask my, my, my employer when I can have off when I can take you know that, that this time away or when I can leave my job and then finally four months later God opens the door for the conversation because you notice Nehemiah doesn't go to the king the king goes to him, him and says what's up Bubba that's simple terms not to you Garland but you know <laughs> right what's wrong what's wrong with you and Nehemiah says well this is what my father God's laid on my heart right 
And then Cyrus, as we know, grants him his wish along with his efforts, and he goes back and builds the wall back around Judea. Yeah, he gives him all the authority first. Like, yeah. And again, when you look at that, see, he wasn't just the guy that went for encouragement. He was the builder, the architect, the politician. He was governor twice. All the things that, everything that God used in that brief time in his life to gain back what they had lost, he gave it all back to him, right? And he used all that he had. That's why we have to realize the importance that you have that you don't discredit yourself in the fact that, well, I'm not the pastor or I'm not uh, so, uh, some big occupant or I'm not the teacher, I'm not the deacon. I, mm, no, God uses what you'll allow him in your life. That's what he allows. Right. The question is, what will we allow? Just like the same statement when he says, I, I accept you just the way you are. And the question has been since uh, the Old Testament, will you accept me? That's what Jesus Christ asked the first time to his own people, right? And they did what? They rejected him. They rejected him and they crucified him. Huh? Anyway, I'm, I'm over on my contract time tonight, but God bless you. I hope you all got something from that. Love you. Uh, Sunday morning, regular service, Sunday night, uh, deacon's ordination. I hope you'll be here for that. Uh, I think we're going to have refreshments after that, aren't we, Deb? Yes. Uh, again, y'all love on Deb, even though she doesn't act like she wants it. And you know, force it, so just force yourself to give her a hug. Anyway. I have to tell her your name. Anyway. Anything else closing in that? God bless y'all. Uh, let's see. Dwayne, would you pray us out, please, sir?